We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Read the book of Daniel. Call up, point by point, the history of the kingdom there represented. The light that Daniel received direct from God was given especially for the last days. When a real love for the Bible is awakened, and a student begins to realize how vast is the field and how precious is treasures, he will desire to seize upon every opportunity for acquainting himself with God's Word. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. Here is the completement of the book of Daniel, one a prophecy and the other a revelation. There in his open hands lay the book, the role of the history of God's provinces, the prophetic history of the nations and the church. The prophecies of Daniel's and Revelation should be printed in small books with the necessary explanations and should be sent all over the world. But for us, we're recording them. We would like for you to join us. We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Prophecies are fulfilling. Strange, eventful history is being recorded in the books of heaven. Events which it was declared should shortly precede the great day of God. May the Holy Spirit strengthen our experience with Christ and fortify us for the final events of these last days. Welcome back to Prophecy Verse by Verse Seminars. Um, today we will be studying from Daniel chapter 11, verses 5 through 13. And before we do that, I would like to invite you for a word of prayer. We can kneel to invite the presence of God to be with us. Our Father, which art in heaven, we come this moment, dear Lord. We want to thank you for your protection and for your loving care. We want to thank you for the sure word of prophecy that we could study the things that you said that will happen, and it happened. We thank you for this, dear Lord, that we can find a, a good foundation for our faith in your sure word, in the word that comes from you. We want to ask your protection and your guidance for the future events, and we want your um, spirit and wisdom to be with us as we are exploring and discovering and understanding more of what you had written for us. We invite your guidance in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. If uh, an announcement was made about uh, 300 years ahead agenda for Middle East, that will catch the attention of the mass media. You say, 2,323 agenda for Middle East. The room will be packed with reporters, with media, with uh, TV companies coming there to find what will be the agenda for Middle East. And they will be ready with a lot of questions. What happens with Egypt? What happens with Palestine? What happens with Syria? What happens with, uh, with the people that live in Israel? What happens with West Bank? They will have a lot of questions. And they find this a good way to advertise biblical prophecy. God put the agenda in Daniel chapter 11. What will happen? Uh, it stirs our curiosity, right? A lot of historical events for those that love history. But I do want to emphasize that Daniel 11 
is more, much more than just history. For those that studied history and prophecy, you know that there is more. It may be a little bit attractive to the human eye to discover the historical events. And sometimes we may get, may get confused and frustrated. King of the North, King of the South, King of the South, King, King of the North. And we may get frustrated in studying all this. But there is something that we need to get from this chapter more than just the history. More than just the, the agenda that God had with these uh, people that were actually interfering with the people of God. And for that, I do want to read a precious paragraph where it says, There is one unbroken chain of events, a silken thread in the web of life, a perpetual spring in the tide of human affairs. This is the record of God's dealings with His chosen people. Egyptian history is noted in the inspired record of the world, but only as it played some part in connection with Jehovah's people. Likewise, Assyria, Babylon, Greece, and Rome, whatever the nation and whatever its place in time, its history is noted by the divine historian only during the time when it has been an instrument in God's hand to spread, to spread His truth or to protect His people. That's why we have history in the Bible. When it's an instrument in God's hand to spread His truth or to protect His people. Yes, we may touch a few historic details, but we will focus more, that's more important, what happens with the people of God. It's both interesting, says uh, Roy Allen Anderson, uh, both interesting and inspiring to know that in the study of church history, that when a prophecy was being fulfilled, there were always some who recognized it. So when we studied Daniel chapter 11, there were always some who recognized it. Now, um, please buckle up and be ready. There will be a lot of material. Have your Bibles at hand. Turn to Daniel chapter 11. We'll try to make it as simple as possible and as understandable. Daniel chapter 11 is a continuation of Daniel 10. Remember, three chapters, Daniel 10, 11, and 12, compose Daniel's last vision. Daniel had three major visions, which we have in the prophecy in the book. We have his first vision. We studied that long ago. Daniel chapter 7, we studied about the four beasts, right? The lion, the bear, the leopard, and the terrible and dreadful. We know what that means, right? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Roman Empire, and then later on turning into papacy. His second vision we studied in Daniel chapter 8. Uh, Babylon was already gone, was fading out, and that's why we have only the focus on the ram and the goat. That is Medo-Persia and Greece. And then Daniel's last vision... This was in the third year of Cyrus. Once again, it doesn't focus anymore on Babylon. It focuses on Medo-Persia towards the end, their last kings, and then Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire and their papal uh, form of, of, of Roman Empire. And he says in the beginning of this vision, we just remember this, that the thing was revealed to Daniel, the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, very long. Actually says in the book Sanctified Life that Daniel received not only the light and truth which he and his people most needed, but a view of the great events of the future even to the advent of the world's Redeemer. And not his first advent, but his second one. His, Jesus' second coming. Now, if you have your Bible in Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 11, it focuses in the beginning, we discussed that with the last kings of the Persian Empire. Remember, we discussed that last time, verses 1 and 2. And he says that the last king of Persia will stir all things against the realm of Grisha. That's how the Greek Empire is introduced. And starting with verse 3 onwards, all the way to verse 13, we have the Greek Empire in prophecy. Again, it's repetitive. 
I would uh, go just quickly back to that slide where we have the visions, the three visions. Notice here, again, you have Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Persia and Greece. And then in his last vision, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Biblical prophecy is often repetitive, zooms in, zooms out, according as God decided to give the information. Similar in Revelation. It's given with more details, and then we, we will see when we study that. Let me go back to the slide. Greek Empire in Daniel chapter 11. Just a quick review. Verse 3 says, A mighty king shall stand up in the Greek Empire. A mighty king shall stand up, shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And we identified us, uh, this one, even in the past, this was Alexander the Great. His first battle was he was only 18. And at the age of 20, he was army general. And at the age of 25, he was the ruler of the civilized world. Uh, his empire was compa compared in the previous visions like a leopard with four wings and uh, was, was conquering so fast. And then four heads, his empire got divided. We, we remember that. We'll see that a little bit later with more details. In Daniel 8, he was compared with the he-goat. And the notable horn was Alexander the Great. It says that was the first king. Now, in Daniel chapter 11, he says, This is a mighty king that shall stand up and will do according to his will. Not according to God's will. But he says, when he shall stand up, his kingdom will happen what? Will be broken. And divided, not to his posterity, but to four winds. He died in 323 before Christ. And remember, we discussed this many times. His empire was divided among how many of his generals? Four generals. What were their names? Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. These four ones. Here is the map. If you want, you can check the history. These were the divisions. Now, something happens with these four generals. Cassander, which was uh, in the most western side, and Lysimachus they will soon be wiped off the map. Notice what happens, a, a historical commentary. It says, Cassander was very soon conquered by Lysimachus and his kingdom, Greece and Macedon, annexed to, uh, to Trace. And Lysimachus was in turn conquered by Seleucus and Macedon and Trace annexed to Syria. So if Cassander and Lysimachus are wiped off the map, they are killed, who is left? We are left with only two, right? Who are left? Seleucus and Ptolemy. From this moment, the history, the biblical history, speaks only about these two. And these two former generals of the Alexandrian Empire, Alexander the Greek Empire, these two former generals will create two dynasties which will be called the King of the North and the King of the South. One that controls more in the north, which, by the way, we discussed last time, north of the people of God, north of Israel. Syria, Syria, pardon, uh, and, and then everything what's north of the people of God. And in the south, we have Ptolemies and their dynasties, a dynasty which were ruling the south. There was a lot of wars between the north and the south. We don't need to study that history. We'll just touch as much as the Bible touches on that. As soon as the Bible makes this separation between the north and the south, as soon as it says we'll be divided in, in two, in four, and then two are eliminated, and then we have north and south, immediately in the Bible prophecy, it starts talking what happens with these kings, north and south. Notice verse 5. The king of the south shall be strong. Once again, who's the king of the south? You got the name? Ptolemy, they are first, and then because you have so many Ptolemies, they have different names. Their first king of the south, he got the name Ptolemy I the Sotter. Don't worry, we'll not describe all of them with this much details. But just because he's the first, 
we, we just described this, was a Macedonian Greek general, historian, and successor of Alexander the Great who went on and found the Ptolemaic Empire centered on Egypt and led by Ptolemaic dynasty, dynasty, dynasty from 305 before Christ, no, immediately after Alexander the Great, through 30 before Christ, when another empire is, is coming up. We know that. Now, going back to verse 5, it says, The king of the south shall be strong, and notice what comes up next. He says, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him. Now, who is this one of his princes? Is he, is he referring to one of Ptolemy's commanders, the king of the south? Notice he says that this prince will have a dominion, dominion, so will have a kingdom. So either he becomes Egypt and wipes off everything, wipes Ptolemy, the king of the south, or rules another kingdom. Something that in this context, I want to emphasize again. Remember when the Bible was written. Do you have commas and dots and exclamation mark and everything? These things were not there. And sometimes, I, I give you a famous example with the thief on the cross. What did Jesus promise to the thief on the cross? <laughs> we'll be with Jesus in heaven. When? Not today. Not when Jesus said that. That's just because of the comma. All right? So, here we have the comma. We have some, some things here. But one of his princes, just because of that comma, don't believe that means one of the princes of the south. Don't believe that is Ptolemy's prince that will wipe off Ptolemy's and take off all that dynasty. No. It is actually one of Alexander's, the great princes. It's just because of the translation and the comma. Notice what happens with this king of the south and with one of his princes, verse 6, and that explains uh, it helps us for that comma. He says, in the end of the years, they shall join themselves together. They will be together. So there are a couple of things that indicate that this other prince in verse 5 is in reference to the king of the north already. It introduces the king of the north, now being Seleucus. And actually, um, Septuagint translation the Italian trans Latin translation, it reads the following. The king of the south shall be strong, and one of his, Alexander's princes, shall be strong above him. So we have the king of the south, we have Ptolemy's and his dynasty, and we have the king of the north that is introduced as one of Alexander's princes. Uh, when we read in history, it says Ptolemy annexed Cyprus, Phoenicia, Caria, Cyrene, and many islands and cities to Egypt. Thus was his kingdom made strong. But Seleucus annexed Macedon and Thrace to Syria, thus becoming possessor of three parts of four of Alexander's dominion and established a more powerful kingdom than of Egypt. So that's how we have Seleucian dynasty. Uh, first uh, king there, because his first, we put a few details about him. Seleucus first, Nicator, was a Macedonian Greek general. Keep in mind Greeks. Keep the Greeks in mind, because we'll have to do with that. Officer and successor of Alexander the Great, who went on and found the eponymous Seleucid Empire, led by Seleucid dynasty. In the power struggles that follow Alexander's death, Seleucus rose from being a secondary player to becoming total ruler of Asia Minor, Syria, Mesopotamia, and the Iranian Plateau, assuming the title of Basileus Emperor. The Seleucid Empire was one of the major powers of the Hellenistic, that's another word for Greeks, Hellenistic world until it was overcome by the Roman Republic and Parthian Empire in the late second and early first centuries before Christ. So we have these two dynasties in the Bible. They are um, king of the south, which in verse 5 is, is reflected the king of the south shall be strong. 
and then we have the Seleucian, Seleucian uh, Empire, the king of the north, which is described in verse 5, one of Alexander's princes shall be strong above him. We read how much the Seleucians they conquered, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. And I just put, if you want to go into details, you can study how many Ptolemies existed. There are so many. In the course of 300 years, there were so many Ptolemies. And the same were a lot of Seleucus, and sometimes they changed to Antioch, Antiochus. Antiochus. Uh, now we have Antioch. Uh, it was even the city in the times of Lord Jesus Christ, Antioch, and the Christians there. Now, verse 6. In the end of the years, they shall join themselves together, the king of the north and the king of the south. Did that happen? It's interesting to see how Bible prophesizes, and it happens in reality. It says there were frequent wars between the kings of Egypt and Syria, between north of Israel and south of Israel. Especially this was the case of Ptolemy Philadelphus, the second king of Egypt, and Antiochus Theos, the king of Syria. They at length agreed to make peace upon a condition, which, by the way, it's mentioned in the Bible, that Antiochus Theus should put away his former wife, Laodice, and her two sons, and should marry Berenice, the daughter of Ptolemy Philadelphus, the, the guy from the south. Ptolemy according, uh, accordingly brought his daughter to Antiochus, bestowing with her an immense dowry. And that was prophesied. It says, King's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. And um, notice what happens next. It says, She shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begot her, and he that strengthened her in these times. Now notice the commentaries how things got fulfilled in the lives of these kings and queen. She shall not retain the power of the arm. That is her interest and power with Antiochus. And so it proved, for some time shortly, in a fit of love, Antiochus brought back his former wife, Laodice, and her children to court again. Then says prophecy, neither shall she, Antiochus, stand nor his arm or sit. Notice what the, king, the queen that was restored did. She being restored to favor and power, feared, he says, in flickness of his temper, the king, Antiochus, would again disgrace her and recall the other queen from Egypt, Berenice, and convincing that nothing short of his death would be an effectual safeguard against such a contingency, she caused him to be poisoned shortly after. Neither did, did uh, um, his seed by Berenice, his son, succeed in the kingdom. For Laodice, the queen, so managed the affairs as to secure the throne for her eldest son, Seleucus Callinicus. You see what jealousy can do? She killed the, the queen from Egypt. She, uh, she, she uh, is about to do something. It says the Bible that jealousy is cruel as a grave. Actually, this queen that came from Egypt, it says she shall be given up. Laodice was not content only to poison the, the king, but she caused even the queen that was brought from Egypt to be killed. And they that brought him, said the prophecy, the Egyptian attendants, the women and everything, they were killed as well. And the Bible says, he that begot her, in other words, whom she brought forth, that is her son, who was murdered at the same time by the order of Laodice. So we can study the history and we see things fulfilled as the Bible predicted. And he that strengthened her in these times, that's the husband, the king, he was as well killed. Now, verses 7 through 9, it says, but out of a branch of her roots... Shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north? So from the south, from Egypt, someone goes against to Syria, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail. 
this was prophesied, and it says, will carry captives into Egypt from the north, from Assyria, a region, and with their princes and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. Now notice what happened in history. A branch of Berenice's Ruth must be a family member. So it was her, her brother, Ptolemy Eurigetes, from the south. He succeeded his father. He raised an army to avenge the death of his sister in the north, that she was from Egypt. She was given to be a queen there. She was assassinated there. So now Ptolemy Eurigetes goes north, as the prophecy was saying. He invaded the territory of Seleucus, who reigned with his mother in Syria. And Ptolemy prevailed against Seleucus. He conquered Syria, he conquered Cilicia, and the upper parts of Euphrates, almost all Asia. But he hears that there is a sedition in Egypt, and then he goes back. But before he goes back, he has to fulfill something that was prophesied. He had to take a lot of gold and a lot of people. Notice what happens. He plundered on the kingdom of Seleucus. He took 40,000 silver, uh, of silver and precious vessels and 2,500 2, images of their gods. Exactly as it was prophesied. I shall carry captives with their gods, with their precious vessels of silver and gold, and carry it where? To Egypt, into Egypt. This is another evidence that the king of the south is the king of Egypt. It um, leads us to verse 10. It says, his sons shall be stirred up. Now again, when it goes his and his, his and his, we need to pay a lot of attention because it switches so quickly from Alexander to Ptolemy to Seleucus and their successors. It, it, it switches so quickly. If you don't pay attention to his sons or what, we may be lost there. Now, who lost in the previous battle? It was the sons of the north. I go back there. They lost, and then now the sons of the, of the guy in the north, they will be stirred up. They need to do something for, to, to claim what, what their father lost. He says, will be stirred up. He says on plural, two sons. Will assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through, then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. So Seleucus, Callinicus had two sons, two guys, Seleucus Serranus and Antiochus Magnus. It's interesting, they were stirred up. Their father lost everything for Egypt. The Egyptians, the Ptolemies, they got everything. So these two sons, they both entered, it's interesting to see how the Bible is fulfilled, the prophecy, they both entered with zeal upon the work of vindicating and avenging the cause of their father and their country. The elder of these, Seleucus, first took the throne. He assembled, uh, assembled a great multitude to recover his father's dominion, but being a weak and possilient, I don't know that word, it's not that familiar to me, cowardly, weak, destitute of strength. He was a, a weak prince, both in body and estate, destitute of money, and unable to keep his army in obedience. He was poisoned by two of his generals after an inglorious reign of two or three years. So he wanted to avenge the death of his father, but he couldn't do that successfully. His other brother, more capable brother, Antiochus Magnus, was thereupon proclaimed king, who was taking charge of the army, retook Seleucia and recovered Syria, making himself master of some places by treaty, and of others by force of arms. A truce followed, uh, wherein both sides treated for peace, yet prepared for war, after um, which Antiochus returned and overcame in battles uh, Nicolaus, the Egyptian general, and had thoughts of invading Egypt itself. So this second guy, Antiochus Magnus, is able to reclaim his father's kingdom, the kingdom of the north, exactly as was prophesied. His sons will be stirred up, and he says, one, 
out of these two shall certainly come. In other words, will be successful and will overflow and will pass through. Will be able to do it. The first one, unfortunately not. Now, verse 11 says, the king of the south, as a reaction of, the, of what the north guys did, the king of the south will be moved with color and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north, and he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. So now, the guy in the south wants to fight with the guys in the north. So let's see who was the one that started fighting against the north, trying to Philo, uh, Ptolemy Philopater, the fourth, he succeeded his father. When he saw what the guy in the north, Antiochus Magnus, did, he made plans to, make, to, to invade Egypt. He came against him with a very numerous army to stop him. The army of Antiochus, the guy from the north, uh, we can see the numbers here, 62,000 footmen, 6,000 horsemen, and 102 elephants. Nevertheless, he was defeated. 10,000 footmen and 3,000 horses were killed and over 4,000 men were taken prisoners. Contrasted with what the guy in the south lost, Ptolemy Philopater's army, he lost only 1,400 men and seven horses. But now, even though this king in the south was victorious, the prophecy says that his heart shall be lifted up. What does it mean when the Bible says the heart is lifted up? Pride, right? Ptolemy uh, Philopater enjoyed pleasure seeking. So instead of securing his kingdom, he gave himself to uncontrolled indulgence and brutish passions. Says um, historian Uriah Smith, thus having conquered the enemies, he was overcame by his vices and forgetful of the heart of the great name which he might have established, he spent his time in feasting and lewdness. It says, when he came to Jerusalem, mm, something that I don't want to be uh, detracted when we study the history. When these people, when these armies were going, the, the, the guys from the south, from Egypt, would go to attack the guys in the north. Where will they pass through? Don't forget that. Through Israel and most likely to Jerusalem. Their armies, when they mar march north, or south, they pass through Jerusalem. Now, when this Egyptian king, he passed through Jerusalem, he offered sacrifices, Ptolemy, Philopater. And he says he was very desirous of entering into the most holy place of the temple. The Greek... Egyptian king wanted to enter into the most holy place. Who's allowed to enter there? Only the high priest once a year. So this Greek king that was ruling Egypt, he wanted to go there. He was restrained. And as a revenge, when he came back to Egypt, he went to Alexandria where Jews had residued since the day of Alexander and enjoyed the privileges of the most favored citizens. And there, he killed 40,000 Jews just because he was not allowed to get into the most holy place. And some sources, according to Jerome, says about 60,000 Jews, the people of God, were killed just because a Greek king from Egypt was not allowed to get into the most holy place. And verse 13 says, The king of the north shall return. Now the man on the north, Seleucus dynasty, shall return and shall set forth a great multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with great army and much riches. Now basically this is the last verse which deals with the Greeks so far to this point. Uh, a band of robbers is introduced in verse 14. Uh, that's uh, someone that was robbing a, a country that started robbing from everybody and building a great empire. We know who's coming after the Greeks, right? But he says, a certain time, certain years, there was some peace 
between the north and the south, Ptolemy Philopater and Antiochus, they had peace for about 14 years. That was quite generous for them. During this time, Ptolemy Philopater, he died from intemperance and debauchery. And he was succeeded by his son, Ptolemy Epiphanes, a child of four or five years of age. And uh, during this time, Antiochus suppressed uh, different rebellions in his own kingdom. He reduced the eastern part of his country to submission. And uh, he felt that it was too good an opportunity to let sleep. So he sat against uh, Egypt. Now, something that after all this discussion, I know it's a lot of history. It's a lot of history. We ba basically just touched a little bit of history. Something that I want to go back, keep this in mind, history is noted in the Bible when, who remembers when? Only when it has to do with the people of God. All this discussion, some of you may wonder, what was all this about? All these historical details and, and fulfillment of the prophecy, well, it was because it happened uh, uh, around the people of God. That's the most important aspect. It had been either an instrument in God's hands to, to, to spread the truth or to protect his people. In all these wars that were going between the north and the south, Israel, the people of God, those that were still residing in that area, were caught in the middle of everything. They were, if we can say, in, the, in between the north and the south, in the, the, the transition area of the Greek or Hellenistic Empire. For 300 years, the people of God are marched on and forth by the Greek armies. Now tell me if that will not affect the people of God. If the Greek armies, the Greek culture goes back and forth over your land every year. Basically, I found a comparison saying that the people of God between the north and the south, they were caught like in a vice. And they suffered. We don't focus that much on Seleucian uh, dynasty or Ptolemaic dynasty, but we need to see what happened with the people of God. Because in the north were Greeks, in the south were Greeks. It doesn't matter, Greeks under Seleucus or Greeks under Ptolemies. Greeks and Greeks. Now question comes towards the end of our study. What did the people of God receive? from the Greeks. Because that's what the lesson is about. If you don't remember about uh, Seleucus uh, Soter or Ptolemy Philopater, you are excused. But what happens, what they got from these Greeks, it's shocking. It comes all the way to us. What the people of God received from the Greeks, it comes all the way to our times. Those of you that studied Christian education by Edward Alexander Sutherland, you know what the world got from the Greeks and even the Christian world. Or even the other book, Broken Cisterns or Living Fountains. Those of you that studied that, you can see what happened with the people of God, with a Christian world, when they were imbued, that time the people of God, 300 years, the Greek armies marching back and forth and sometimes sitting on the land of the Jews. To such an extent that when the people of God, in the times of Apostle Paul, he was a missionary in Greece, in Greece and he says in Corinthians, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are save, saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? 
Where is the disputer of this world? Had not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a what? We discussed this morning. A sign. Miracles. And the Greeks seek after what? After wisdom. And notice verse 23. It says, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, foolishness. So for the king of the north, the king of the south, and their soldiers, Jesus and preaching the cross was foolishness. That's what the people of God got from them. Don't talk to me about this, Jesus. That's what they got. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. So what did the people of God got from the Greeks, from the king of the north and the king of the south? Both Greeks. It says, the gross idolatry of Babylon and Egypt was replaced in Greece by a more refined worship, if they can be said to be degrees of refinement in licentiousness. When you read what was happening in the temple of Ephesus, what they were doing there, at any rate, Greek customs were less revolting on the surface and hence more subtle and ensnaring. Whom do you prefer? A guy that tells you wrong things in front of you or someone that comes behind and sneaks behind? It's better to have someone that speaks clear. Notice, continuing from Stephen Haskell, at the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles called the Hebrew race together and promoted unity and love of God. So the Greek games gathered the people together promoting one common language, religion, and law. That sounds a little bit with what's happening in the world nowadays. One common language, religion, and law. It's, it's transpiring little by little. So, God's people met for spiritual worship, the Greeks for physical and intellectual enjoyment. Keep that in mind. We can meet a little bit, worship a little bit, we play games, we enjoy, we have fun. Or we really worship God. Keep that in mind, it still transpires in our times. The history of Greece is the history of physical and intellectual culture. That's why we even can study some of the calendars and can study history based on the Olympic Games. Because we lost the, the, the track of time, and then we know that each uh, five years are the Olympic Games, and then we trace, and then that's how we calculated some of the historical events. It was difficult to find back all the way those centuries. Now, how important or how good it is to play sports, to have fun, and then to worship a little bit God? How healthy is that for your spiritual life? Have fun, play games, and worship God a little bit. This is where the people of God were living in that society which were intensely promoting their games, physical, and intellectual culture. To such an extent that inspired Apostle Paul, when he was writing to a young minister, Timothy, he says, bodily exercise profited little. It's something it could do good for your body. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. Just keep that in mind. And then he, co he, he continued, especially to the believers in Corinth. says, guys, you need to make sure you worship God. 
He says, we know that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. The apostle had to write to the believers because their spiritual life was affected by the Greeks. This Greek king of the north and Greek king of the south from Daniel 11 with their armies, with their cultures, with their everything, they affected the people of God. The first thing in the history of Greece bright, uh, bring the student face to face with that country as an intellectual power and reveal the secret of her strength into her language and philosophy. She conquered the world by bringing all minds unto her control. But what Greece would not gain in territory, she did gain as a teacher of nations. And although she finally lost all territorial supremacy, uh, thou like the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, the tree was cut down, yet the roots remain unto this day. Pay attention to this paragraph. Your children, if they attend public school, are affected by the Greek culture. Her, talking about Greek, Greece, her Greek philosophy is studied Today, it's studied under the guise of modern writers. Her ideas are instilled into the minds of her children, from kindergarten to universities. And students graduate from the schools of the land knowing much more of the mythology of Greece than they do of the religion of Jesus Christ. Better acquainted with the Greek heroes than with a man of Calvary. Greek learning still rules the world, and it will until the setting up of the everlasting kingdom of God, until the stone cut out without hands shall fill the earth. Remember Daniel chapter 2. So, of course, the question may come, what was God's plan then for all these nations, including Greece, Grisha, or Greece? God still gave time to everybody to repent, even to the Greeks. Alexander the Great, he actually came and he worshipped God when he was encountered by the uh, priests that came out of Jerusalem. He worshipped God, but he went uh, to Egypt and he proclaimed himself as God. He had his time to repent. Ptolemy Philadelphus, you know, it's interesting because in this darkness, God still used a few of these uh, uh, kings, like Ptolemy Philadelphus, and he was the one that encouraged the translation of the Old Testament into Greek language. God still wanted the people to have, li to have light. So we have philosophy from the Greeks. By the way, what is philosophy? What does philosophy mean? What do you understand by philosophy? Opinions? Any other thoughts? What, what is philosophy? I, I believe it's, it's quite a translatable world, word. How do we say philosophy in Spanish? Philosophia or something? There we go. It's pretty much the same word in the whole world. What is philosophy? We have it from the Greeks. The people of God have from the Greeks philosophy. What is philosophy? A science of doubt. Let's analyze. Is it in reality so? Can we discuss it? Do we really have a standard or it's a debatable? Relativity. I remember when I was in college and uh, I had one of my professors, it was in science, human geography or something, and he said, you see, we have natural sciences and all these sciences, but the mother of all sciences is philosophy. Yeah, it says philosophy. 
questioning, analyzing, debating. And it, it leads me to think, when you think about questioning, analyzing, questioning, it leads me to that original question, has God really said so? It opens our minds. And that's why, again, to another church that was located in, in Greece, Apostle Paul wrote this, Be aware of what? Beware, lest any man spoil you through what? Philosophy. Be careful with that. And vain deceit. After the tradition of man and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Be aware. Be careful. And notice what happened. The Jews mingled the teachings of the Bible with the philosophy of Plato. If you think Daniel 11 just talks about the king of the north and the south, no, 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 that's not the history lesson. It's what happened with the people of God. Otherwise, we would not have this part of, in the Bible with the king of the north and the south. It says, the Jews mingle the teachings of the Bible with the philosophy of Plato, and that form the traditions of men, against which Christ so often warned his followers. The false philosophy and the science falsely so-called, of Paul's times, was Greek teaching which breathed the spirit of Plato and his students. And notice the next sentence. The, Jew, the whole Jewish teaching was Hellenized. Helen, Hellenus, it's the old word which describes the territory of Greeks, Grisha, Greece. The whole Jewish system was imbued with the philosophy of the Greek Empire. That's what happened. When you read the King of the North and the King of the South, I know it was a little bit maybe exasperating for you to go to a lot of history, King of the North and King of the South. But what happened with the people of God? It's shocking. It says the whole Jewish teaching was Hellenized, and keep in mind, this was the time and when there was no prophet in Israel for how many years? 400 years. Greek world was leading everything there, north and south. They were all Greeks. And to such an extent, the whole Jewish teaching was Hellenized. And when John the Baptist was born, his mother and father were commanded to leave the city of Jerusalem and educate the child in the desert, away from the influence of the schools and the society of the Jews. Why? Because they were, in essence, Greek schools. So God tells, tells them, he says, your child better learns in nature than the Jewish schools, which are imbued with a Greek philosophy. Keep in mind, the people of God were like in a vice. They were caught in the middle. There was escape to go in nature, to study in nature. The people of God today, they are not compelled to go where you would be imbued with Greek philosophy and with the philosophies of this world. And keep in mind that above all this history that we study in Daniel chapter 11, the history is noted when God spreads his truth or protects his people. And keep in mind that all these kings, the king of the north and the king of the south, were allowed by God or were removed by God. Remember the precious lesson from Daniel 2? He removed kings, he set it up kings. God is in control. And now tell me, which, who is strong? Which king is strong here that, that God put there? Who is the strongest there? You know what's interesting? I take the most valuable lesson from Daniel 11, even though there were kings with armies, with thousands of, of soldiers. It says that they were strong. Yeah, they were strong. They had armies and everything. But I find that the anchor, even though the people of God were caught in a vice there, it says the people that know their God shall be strong. No matter what happens, no matter who flows in your land, 
no matter who does things in your land and controls your land, but if you know your God, you'll be strong. So strong that he says in the last chapter of Daniel that they will be wise, will shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they shall turn many into righteousness, will, will, will shine as stars forever and ever. And that lasts. Amen. Thank you for participating to this seminar. There is a book that will help us stand and help us uh, be prepared for many things that will be coming. Obviously, number one book is the Bible. Another book that we still give for free is the Great Controversy Luxury Edition. If you want to receive it, you can just tell me or you can call us at 615-868-8182 or you can write us at SDRM Nashville. Um, at um, uh, gmail.com. Thank you. So we conclude here the seminar. Let's have a word of prayer and um, we thank God for His Word. Our Father, which art in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the word of prophecy. We thank you that you recorded history and we could check the historical events and the people that lived in those times. And we could see that you proclaim and it comes to happen. If we have some misunderstandings of, or we cannot comprehend everything that you said, help us, dear Lord. Give us more light. Help us to, to, to dig deeper, to find especially what you have for your people. Help us, dear Lord, to know you and to be among your people every day until the end and throughout eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.